Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. I'm Kevin Charbonneau with Hancock Software, and I'm uh, glad to have you all joining us here today. I saw from the registration list most of you are uh, existing Hancock Software customers, and we're going to do something a little different today than the normal webinar where we're talking about some of the new product features and enhancements. Uh, we're going to be joined uh, by John Jones from BPI and talk a little bit about how we might begin planning for some of this new federal funding headed our way in 2023. And so I'd like to uh, also welcome uh, those of you on the webinar who aren't our existing customers, and I hope you find this information uh, useful. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, John Jones uh, with the uh, Building Performance Institute. You know BPI is the organization that certifies home energy efficiency contractors. And uh, John is the uh, National Technical Director. Uh, maybe, John, you can say hello and uh, just say a word or two about how BPI uh, is involved with the evolving guidelines for uh, the Inflation Reduction Act funding. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Kevin. So yes, I'm John Jones, BPI National Technical Director, and uh, I oversee a lot of the different uh, programs at NYSERDA, sort of including certification development, standard development, and contractor programs. And I work closely with our CEO, Larry Zarker, on policy issues and coordinating with states and energy efficiency program administrators and also the US DOE and EPA. And um, as many of you probably know, uh, BPI has been called out in this act as far as BPI 2400 standard is concerned. Um, also, uh, we're pointing to on our certifications in there as well. And so uh, there's been a lot of discussions with uh, the state energy program administrators and um, we are an affiliate with NASIO. So we're talking directly with uh, the states as closely as possible and helping get information out to the state uh, program energy program administrators uh, and trying to stay ahead of this before it comes. And also we do um, coordinate as close as we can with folks uh, uh, at DOE and EPA since they are also getting funding in this and folks with their national lab partners so that we can um, try to make this as, as seamless as possible for uh, the program administrators and not try to uh, put barriers up that would cause any issues for either them or their contractors that are participating in their programs or their customers as well. So um, we belong to various policy groups that are working on this on these issues, um, such as NYSERDA and um, Mass Saves, especially uh, in the Northeast where these programs are long standing. And, uh, we're, and possibly if we need it, we'll work with the um, governor's offices of each one of those states to help provide them some guidance as well. So BPI is very active in this sphere and we'll be getting into that a little bit more throughout the presentation. Well, thank you, John, and, and we're thrilled to have you joining us here today. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, just a short outline here. Um, I'm gonna take a couple minutes up front to, to talk about what we do know about the funding that's coming uh, our way and uh, flip it over to John then for some discussion on some of the challenges and, and the ways that the uh, guidance will be evolving as, as we go forward into 2023. And then I'll wrap up with a few minutes on how we at Hancock Software, I think we might be able to help. So getting right into it, uh, we're all aware that uh, the, the law that was signed into effect back in August is the, one of the largest or the largest investment in energy efficiency history in the US. And specifically for those of us on this call, it involves nine billion dollars in rebates and training for residential energy efficiency. Uh, this is a bit of an eye chart but uh, makes the point that there's just a lot to consider as you plan to expand your programs going into 2023. Um, so just a, a quick summary, the home energy uh, performance-based rebates, uh, 4.3 billion dollars that will be distributed to uh, the state energy offices. Uh, for both modeled and measured uh, benefits, and, and John will explain a little bit more about that. Uh, provides $2,000 for up to 20% uh, of savings and $4,000 for 35% uh, energy savings. Uh, the income eligibility aren't the typical federal poverty level measures, but rather HUD-based 
area of median income based. And so there's going to be some uh, qualification challenges. Uh, and the incentives uh, are doubled over those numbers I gave you for uh, those people making less than 80% of those area median incomes. Moving on down to the high efficiency electric home rebate, there's another $4.5 billion going to the state energy offices for electrification, uh, insulation, and air sealing measures uh, provide a benefit of 50% of the project cost, up to $14,000, and that will be doubled to 100% uh, for those people below the 80% area median income levels. And all of that's on top of the uh, DOE WAP funding that you're already managing, um, keeping in mind that the bipartisan infrastructure law gave us another $3.5 billion to be run uh, with virtually the same rules as the original DOE funding, uh, but those were for households under 200% of that federal poverty level and uh, um, requires DOE approved modeling, either the National Energy Audit Tool, NEAT, uh, and Hancock Software, as you'll see in a moment, also has uh, a DOE approved modeling tool we call HEAT. And then I do have listed here some tax credits. You know, historically, that's not been a major concern uh, when you're dealing with uh, benefits for uh, poverty level households. Uh, but uh, this funding expands into other households that uh, we're going to need to keep an eye on these tax credits to make some wise choices about the measures that we're offering to these homeowners and getting the maximum benefit for any given household. Um, uh, we're going to need to keep an eye on these tax credits as well. So the environment's getting quite a bit challenging, and that's where I'll flip things over to John here. John, just say next slide, and, and I'll skip through, and, and you can kind of bring us up to speed on, on what's evolving. Sure. So um, as I said, BPI has been involved in, in a lot of the different policy groups and speaking with states and energy efficiency program administrators, and, and there has always been these specific challenges that keep popping up. And um, those are the first three on the screen that I'm gonna be talking about there. The program design and planning and the software consistent with BPI 2400 and quality assurance and how all of this is going to impact programs. So if you can jump into the next slide, we'll jump right into this one here. So when we're talking about the um, energy efficiency and design and planning, um, state programs are already starting to develop their plans or thinking about their plans and getting groups together internally and um, thinking about how this will actually happen and they've got to make some big decisions here are they going to be doing modeled uh, versus measured versus electrification which are you know which is going to be able to be integrated into an existing program if they have one running and how does um, what will the guidance be coming out of DOE as far as how they will run the model programs and you know what what uh, requirements are going to be put onto the contractors and and other programs may say well you know what um, we don't want to um, deal with the modeled stuff and and you know because it's going to be too hard to integrate into our program and so we'll just stick with a measured and and then then talking about bringing on some type of an aggregator model or however it may be and then other programs will just say let's just go with the uh, electrification we're not sure. Um, but also, um, there may be other programs that, are, that aren't currently running multifamily programs that they'll expand into that. And how will that uh, uh, impact their current resources within their uh, uh, organization or within their energy efficiency program? And do they even have an implementer that is um, proficient in multifamily building? So there's a lot of questions that need to be going into the design and program. Well, like we like I was saying, the hardest the hardest hit is going to be the existing efficiency energy efficiency programs, and um, as we know, everybody's waiting with bated breath on what the DOE guidance will be and what the requirements will be coming out of DOE, and um, making sure that uh, it, maybe if you're an existing state program, reaching out to NASIO um, or to your governor's office to get engaged and and provide guidance and see to DOE to make sure what the uh, um, the requirements are going to be is going to be able to be mapped within your program. Um, you know, what will be the income qualification requirements and you know, how are they doing it now? Some, some states are doing it possibly at a county level now. Are they going to flip over to a, to a state level so that they can get, you know, broaden the, the, the uh, pool of candidates that can come in? Um, because if you take a state like New York or some of these other states that where you have Manhattan incomes will be... Uh, compared with the lower income 
communities and it just raises the bar uh, as far as the number of participants that can operate. Um, but the main one is how, how to integrate the funds with the existing funds and how, you know, how much disaggregation there will need to be of existing um, SBC funds or uh, public funds and that are being brought into a program and what, what which stream is going to be better for which measure, right? So uh, that all has to be hammered out by these programs. And um, if they're going to be using model, they're going to be looking for software vendors to help solve this problem. They're going to be looking for their implementation, implementation contractors to help solve this problem. So there's just a lot of unknowns right now. Um, and we don't know if some states may just outright reject the funding. Uh, they may say, you know what, this is going to be too hard for us to figure out. We don't have the resources internally to write the plan to make this work. So we're just going to re reject the funds. Um, but I don't want to just throw a whole bunch of bad news out there. But um, I do want to let you know that BPI is working with policy team to help figure some of this stuff out. And one, one thing that we have identified is that a state like Massachusetts that has various uh, streams of funding coming in and various models of the program, that that may be one of the better test beds to figure out. And if we can figure out how to make it work in Massachusetts, it may solve the problem for like 85% of the rest of the states. Yes, you're going to have some outliers out there that are going to have some funky little um, barrier that could cause a real problem. But that's that that, that can be figured out um, as we go down through this. Because if you think about um, Any time a program or uh, an act like this comes out, it takes a long time to get the funds out. So we do have some time, but not that much. You know, there, from uh, what I'm hearing is that we're thinking the funds might start flowing middle of next year towards the later part of the summer, maybe early part. And um, so uh, we have a little bit of time on that. Another one we've heard about is the BPI 2400 language that's in, that, that says that the software has to be consistent with it um, and you know so we need to figure out okay so what does that mean for modeled energy um, energy modeling software out there and so one thing it has to have it has to have a historical energy use component to it and what does that mean and does the software actually have that and how many products on the market are currently complying with the BPI 2400 uh, language that's in the standard and uh, right now there is no methodology for verifying which software by a third party I should say uh, of software that is compliant and and consistent with it so software uh, vendors right now are self attesting that their software does that so uh, we've been asking DOE to work with their national lab partners to see if there's a possibility of, of uh, anointing one of the labs to set up a system to do that for the software um, but we're not sure what the guidance will be and how they're actually going to be doing this is there going to be one software that's going to be pointed to is there going to be a national public version of it that's going to be used we don't know um, and what how will this impact programs that are using simple spreadsheets and priority lists you know are they all and this is why I'm saying some programs may just say you know we're not going to use the funding and the funding will just get redistributed at some point down the road to other states. Um, and, how, and how does the BPI 2400 impact participants in the programs that are getting delivered fuels? So if you think about a year like this year, what is the primary fuel usage? Last year and, they, and the year before, they may have said like fuel oil. Um, now this year, they may say wood or pellets. Um, same thing for your natural gas um, folks. A lot of people will say that on a on a year that natural gas doesn't cost much, that's our primary fuel, but this year it's going to be pellets. You know? So we need to make sure that there's language and alternative pathways for software to be con compliant and consistent with BPI 2400. And so BPI uh, has a, is establishing a team to take care of this issue. And as you can see, we're going to involve software developers, state energy official uh, uh, plan a uh, uh, program staff that are running energy programs, the national labs. We're making sure that NREL and PNNL and DOE are involved in these uh, meetings so that we don't just have something pop out of a uh, black box. We're going to take it out to, for public comment to make sure that it'll work 
and we'll be working closely with partners to make sure that we don't do anything that's going to, to throw up any barriers and we want to make it easy but for guidance for right now is what we're telling software vendors is to make sure that you can uh, that the software can produce an hpxml file and we recommend that it can be compatible with open studio hpxml because we're not sure where the where doe is going to land on this but if we can get if your software and your program can do that or if you're working with vendors right now i would make sure we ask them to do that and the, the third issue we've heard about is the quality assurance you know uh, especially for the installed measures and how do we verify that they've actually been installed if a contractor says that they're installing x um, appliance x furnace x heat pump how do we make sure that is um, been installed and are we going to do this in field by putting boots on the ground sending people in uh, around to people's houses or are we going to do this virtually uh, working with the contractor through some streaming media so and when they're going doing the test out of the home or doing the the last person out of the home and checking off the check boxes, make sure stuff is ver uh, installed, that they are streaming that to somebody uh, virtually, or is it gonna be done remotely using images of here's here's what was there before, here's what we installed. And um, that includes that there must be some type of a certificate of completion certified by a third party. So that you can see that um, this doesn't always fit models of existing programs of how they do quality assurance, so we've got to figure that out. So all those questions are still um, being asked of DOE, and we don't we do know that DOE is working closely with their lab partners to work on this and get something out there that's not going to be too strenuous. It's not going to be too much of a barrier for for participants in the program. And what I mean by that is the contractors that are going to be doing the work, because if we have too many barriers out there, they're not going to participate. Um, so one thing we're um, asking con or the software developers to do is have something that's very contractor friendly, easy to use. It can't be, it can't take that much time to do this stuff. Ability to upload images so that it can help out through the quality assurance process um, and making sure that guidance is given to contractors as far as what type of images they need to take, what their equipment needs to be compatible with and the type of resolution rates that we're talking about and give guidance on how to take the images. Believe it or not, we have to actually do that. We have to let them know this is the angle you need to take it at. This is what we're looking for. And again, having the ability to, uh, uh, we're telling software vendors, you know, then HPXML file, again, recommend compatible with Open Studio, but definitely make sure the software can upload images and even possibly a short video. It's, it's, it's where we're going. It's how we reduce quality assurance costs, um, but it's not going to work on all um, systems in all areas, especially in the rural areas. So I'll turn this back over to Kevin. Thank you, John. Uh, that's quite uh, scary, uh, intimidating, I think, for a lot of people on the, on the phone. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll be looking forward eagerly to uh, news from you and from DOE on uh, some more specific guidance on how these things will work. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes now and talk about um, you know, how Hancock software can help uh, in that process uh, and, and hopefully take some of the scariness out for, for some of our customers. Uh, I, I do want to pause here for a moment and just uh, let everyone know we're going to take a few minutes at the end uh, for some questions. We may actually go a little over the top of the hour. Uh, but if you have questions, please enter them in the questions box uh, in the panel, and uh, we will uh, try to handle uh, a few of those at the end of the call. So if I can summarize what I thought I heard John say, uh, and then I'll talk about each of these points from Hancock Software's perspective. Coordinating the new IRA funds with existing state utility programs uh, and tax credits, for that matter, uh, I think John uh, said was uh, probably one of the uh, biggest challenges they're they're trying to address going forward and just you know, where can you use fundings on which measures and and split funding or not and and uh, just all those kinds of questions that uh, we've dealt with in the past but uh, just get a lot more complicated now going forward uh, he talked about the the modeled savings analysis uh, and the the needs to be able to uh, be xml HBXML compliant and, and uh, PPI 2400 compliant and so on. Uh, Multifamily weatherization is something we're hearing. Uh, there's quite a bit of incentive to uh, target multifamily buildings in this funding and 
for the state energy offices that we work with, uh, they're all asking, you know, the only way we're going to be able to spend this much money is to start taking on uh, multifamily work. Maybe they weren't doing it before. And then, uh, of course, BPI is uh, key uh, in accelerating workforce development, certifying new uh, energy contractors, energy auditors, and so on. And we've got some things to help uh, along those lines. When we talk about qualifying multiple funding sources and managing the rules about what measures can be used on, on which jobs and, and leverage which funding, uh, we've got a rules engine already in Hancock Software, many of you are familiar with. Uh, you're already using uh, this rules engine to set up multiple programs. And whatever the guidelines come out of DOE, we're going to be able to configure those uh, in our rules engine so that when you finish uh, a client's application, collect all the information uh, that's required to be able to qualify a household against any of these programs. Uh, you simply come in, hit this qualify button, it will run their application information against those rules and serve up uh, those programs that they qualify for. So it takes a lot of the confusion away from your staff, takes a lot of confusion away from the uh, the, the, the workers that are in the homes about which measures uh, can allocate funding for, from which sources and, and on which households. And again, it's not just the programs that are coming uh, with IRA, but you've already got uh, some utility program funding, sometimes municipal funding and other funding sources that you've got to braid together. Uh, this rules engine will help make sure that that can be done accurately and efficiently. And we do have an offline uh, mobile energy audit tool already that exists. It is uh, certified by DOE for uh, uh, use on your existing WAP projects, uh, but it is uh, easily configured for any of these new rules that come down. Uh, it allows you to apply measures uh, for multiple funding sources and the incentives that come from those. Uh, and uh, runs uh, contractors uh, not only for the initial audit and the modeling, but also in the installation mode and the inspection mode, uh, which will help with some of those quality assurance issues that John was talking about. The energy modeling is, um, as I mentioned, approved by DOE today for, uh, uh, for use uh, in lieu of their NEAT tool. Uh, for those who choose to do that and use our embedded tool, it provides a lot of benefit uh, when you have installers that go out and, you know, in the real world that don't exactly uh, line up with what the auditor imagined that measure might look like when it's installed. And any of those changes can be captured by the installer and, and run that model uh, as part of the embedded system without having to go back and re-enter all that information in a, in a DOE offered uh, neat tool. Uh, we are uh, compliant with the BPI 2400 standard that uh, John was referencing, uh, so we can um, uh, check that box and make sure that you're also compliant with, for this new funding. Uh, includes not just the weatherization measures, but also the electrification measures. Half of this money coming is for, uh, you know, uh, heat pumps and, and other electrification measures to uh, help reduce the greenhouse gas impact of each of the homes. And we've also got health and safety measures that can be run in here. Uh, there are um, weatherization readiness measures, and uh, the tool is already HPXML connected. Uh, we're using, we have customers using it now, for example, uh, to uh, collect all that audit data, and then with the push of a button uh, through the API connector, um, moves that data over to DOE, where DOE generates a home energy score and sends back to us through the API connector a a uh, home energy score. So um, we do have that HP XML capability that John was referencing. Um, you know, when you use the same tablet that the auditor was using, the same platform that the installer was using uh, as an inspector, you can sync that inspector up with that same project data. Uh, they're able to compare the installation work with the audit, accept or reject the measures, uh, capture photos or videos, uh, while they're on site or, or virtually, if that's the way it needs to happen, and uh, create recall work orders on these rejected measures. Uh, we can create roles for QCI uh, at the project level and also at the program level. We have states that have DOE inspectors that log into their systems to, to verify the programs are being run uh, as intended. So uh, a lot of help that can be offered there. 
Multifamily, uh, several of you are already using our tool uh, in multifamily. Obviously, the application process for multifamily is quite different. Uh, so we have a portal where uh, your property managers can uh, upload all of their resident information, all their information uh, as a multifamily uh, facility. And then, you know, tracking a project uh, for multifamily is quite a bit more cumbersome than you know, going in for an afternoon and, and doing a few measures on a house. So these projects sometimes last weeks or months and being able to track that project uh, professionally and uh, in an organized platform uh, definitely facilitates the process. From a workforce development perspective, um, we have a guided audit uh, mode that can be offered. Uh, think about sending uh, a team of interns out to a large multifamily building and just guiding them through step by step. Um, can't go to the next step till the last step is complete. Uh, getting whatever lease is signed by the, the household that needs to be signed. Uh, going through each of the measures, all the safety tests, collecting all the data and reminding them if they miss data that's needed for the energy model to, to be valid, uh, to collect that data before they're, they're done with their audit. Uh, so it really enables uh, some of the newer and lesser skilled audit staff to be uh, accurate and complete uh, and make sure that uh, uh, we can bring on as much staff and as many inspectors as possible and really guide them through uh, this process and make sure they're collecting meaningful and accurate data. So I'm going to wrap up just uh, to ask you uh, to invite us to uh, be involved early in your planning process. Uh, you know, what does our software already support in terms of how you plan to accommodate some of these programs? Uh, what changes will we be making to accommodate this uh, forthcoming DOE guidance? And, um, you know, just to ask you all to allow us the opportunity to be your partner for the rapid deployment of these much needed funds. We could spend years trying to get systems and, and programs set up uh, to, to do this in a transparent and uh, meaningful way, but uh, I think um, leveraging vendors like Hancock Software, uh, we're going to be able to get you up and running and getting those money to those homeowners uh, in, a, in a much faster timeline. All right, uh, so with that, I just wanted to invite you all to uh, ping us with a couple of questions. And uh, we have one that's coming here. Uh, do you anticipate the rebate qualify feature will allow users to easily ID whether to include an electrification measure in the model savings or leave it out and take the prescriptive rebate and get homes percent reduction rebate with the, without the electrification? Qualify feature. Uh, wow, that's a pretty detailed design question. I'm not sure I'm qualified. If I can steal your word uh, to, to answer the details on that. Um, and, and I don't think we have guidance even from DOE yet as to how much uh, opportunity there'll be to uh, share or overlap the uh, electrification measures with those uh, those modeled and measured measures. So, John, uh, do you know any more about what we know about the guidance between those two parts of the program? We don't, and that's some of the scary stuff that people are um, waiting to hear about. I don't want to say scary, I just you know some of the confusing stuff and the opportunity to be able to do that, right? Um, and so that is some of the challenges that that, is, that programs are asking about. So, um, I mean, we can definitely bring this information back to DOE, and if you are a NASIO affiliate, then make sure you get that information to NASIO so that they can bump it up to DOE as well. Very good. Uh, other questions? All right, um, we'll give a, just another moment for another question to pop in, but I did want to let you know this webinar has been recorded and we will be distributing a link to that recording uh, so that you can review it again or share it with uh, some of your colleagues. And uh, also want to invite you to reach out directly to myself or to John. Uh, again, John is uh, plugged into the people who are making the decisions that are going to affect our lives for some years to come. So uh, any of your concerns now, uh, I think it'd be a good time to, to have John uh, help address them uh, sooner rather than later, right? Absolutely. Yep. 
All right, uh, since I don't see another question coming in, we're going to go ahead and close the presentation. And again, thank you all for joining us here today.